Good morning, everyone. My name is Grant Williams. I'm a portfolio and strategy advisor for Volpez Investment Management, a hedge fund based in Singapore, and for the last several years, the publisher of a financial letter called Things That Make You Go Hmm. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about madness, uh, particularly madness that we find in markets. Uh, and when talking about such things, I've found generally over the years, it makes sense to begin with a Scotsman. Now, 170 years ago, Charles Mackay published what he called A History of Popular Folly, and it was titled Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. The book set about debunking various curiosities of the day, which included, amongst other things, witch hunts, fortune telling, and even something uh, called the influence of politics and religion upon the shape of hair and beard, which must, I'm sure, have been a riveting read. Now, buried amongst these eclectic topics, however, were three chapters that have become uh, academically revered as having seminal importance in the history of social psychology. And these three chapters dealt with what Mackay called economic bubbles. The three examples uh, Mackay examined were the Dutch tulip mania of the early 17th century, the Mississippi Company bubble and the South Sea bubble, and both of those uh, coincidentally reached their peaks in the same year, 1720. Now, as you're about to see, with the benefit of hindsight, the mania that affected all three is glaringly obvious, and yet, at the time, clearly, enough people were blind to the facts in front of them to allow the madness to take place. And that's the thing about bubbles. They only happen because the vast majority of people can't or won't see them for what they are. Now, I've been involved in financial markets for almost 30 years, and during that time, I've seen bubbles and booms, crashes and collapses, and pretty much everything in between. But right now, today, there are two situations staring investors in the face that I honestly believe will one day be looked back upon, just like the subprime market is today, and people will say, what the hell were they thinking? One of them is clearly a bubble, uh, and one is anything but, yet. Before we get to the madness of today's markets, I want to set the scene with a look at a couple of those bubbles of earlier vintage that were examined by Mackay in the 1840s. They look as crazy today as they must have done immediately after they burst, but of course, like all good bubbles, only a few people saw them for what they were before they burst. As Mackay said, men go mad in herds while they only recover their senses one by one. Now, the first real recorded bubble was rather odd. It involved the price of tulips, of all things. Now, this chart uh, shows the trajectory of the price of tulip bulbs in 17th century Holland. They were introduced to the country in the 16th century, uh, and these tulips became highly prized as a, as a status symbol. And, and when bulbs began appearing that contained a strain of something that turned out to be the mosaic virus, which made their blooms multicolored, the price went through the roof, as you can see here. At the height of this mania, uh, in the middle of 16, uh, 1637, a single tulip bulb routinely fetched about 10 times the salary of a skilled craftsman, uh, and often as much as 12 acres of land were exchanged for one bulb. Now, as you can see from this chart, tulip prices came down to earth with a bump in early 1637, when an outbreak of the plague meant that buyers at an auction in Harlem uh, failed to show up, and this left only sellers at the auction. Sellers who, no doubt, suddenly realised they were holding flower bulbs, for which they paid a ridiculous sum of money. Panic selling ensued, and the price, as you can see, went basically to zero in a matter of weeks. Next, we have the South Sea Company, which was a British public-private partnership, founded in 1711 and given a monopoly to trade with South America, hence the name. Crucially, it was also established in part to try and consolidate and reduce the cost of Britain's national debt. At the time it was granted its monopoly, Britain and Spain were still at war, and Spain controlled South America. So trade between the two was never liable to be either easy or abundant, nor was the South Sea Company ever liable to make any great profit from the French, frankly. But in true bubble fashion, none of that mattered. Insider trading at government debt auctions, bribery, corrupt politician, acts of parliament designed solely to feather the nests of those running the scheme, insider loans collateralised by the company's shares being used to buy more shares. I mean, this, this, this one literally had it all. It was a bubble and a Ponzi scheme rolled into one. And when the bubble finally burst, it led to a collapse in the share price, a parliamentary inquiry, the shaming of many politicians, suicides, and eventually something called the Bubble Act, which was designed to stop fraudulent schemes such as this from taking place thereafter. It was the study of these early bubbles that led to the identification of what became known as the classic bubble wave. Historically, just about all bubbles have gone through the four classic stages you're about to see on the chart appearing here. The stealth phase is when none but a few really forward thinkers are either paying attention to an idea or investing in it. The idea is nearly always trading below its fundamental value, represented here by the uh, yellow dotted line, and that's due in large part to either apathy or lack of awareness on the part of the investing public. Personally, I prefer to call this the smart money phase. The awareness phase is when an investment is beginning to be talked about and discussed by a much wider group, often including fringe media and such. 
It be, at this point, uh, the idea begins to rise above its fundamental value because money is starting to steadily move into the idea. This is the stage where it begins to attract hot money and volatility tends to increase. Now, many investors get shaken out at this very point when they grow either frustrated at the increased volatility or they sell too early because they're afraid of missing what they deem to be the top. It really does take nerves of steel to ride a bull market all the way to the end. Now things get interesting as we move into what's known as the mania phase. This is where the idea gains the attention of the media, the wired media, not to mention a thousand new so-called experts and, of course, the investing public, who are sadly always the last, always the last people aboard any of these trains once they leave the station. The price action in this phase is spectacular as investors chase the asset and are desperate not to miss out. As you can see here, fundamentals are left in the dust as the mania allows the most spurious of justifications for paying extremely high prices relative to fair value. Now, after the party inevitably comes the hangover, uh, and the blow-off phase is where the pain sets in. This phase is the dash for the exits, uh, though as the initial downdraft uh, hits, there are still a few more sorry souls who feel as though they've been given that one last chance after having missed out on, on the chance to get in on something really special. Sorry guys, this classic pattern is all too familiar to any of us who pay attention to markets. We saw it in Japan through the Japanese miracle of the 1980s when twin bubbles in real estate and stocks represented here by the Nikkei 225 burst in unison. Looks familiar, huh? We saw it in the Nasdaq technology boom in the 1990s when everybody just had to have those crazily expensive tech stocks at nosebleed valuations. But the pattern doesn't solely apply to stocks or equity indices. We saw it in crude oil in the run-up to the 2008 crisis when oil peaked at almost 150 bucks before falling to the mid-30s. And we famously saw it most recently in US house prices in the noughties. Basically, human nature being what it is, these bubbles are, of course, bound to follow an almost identical pattern. Thousand years of, uh, thousands of years of human psychological conditioning isn't something that's going to be altered, except in tiny, imperceptible increments. This point is even more salient in that all bubbles are driven by one of only two very different human emotions, which we will come to in a moment. It's also the reason why, whenever you hear these four words, you should immediately be on your guard. Folks, it's never different. A bubble is a bubble is a bubble. Now, the economist Herbert Stein is credited with the formulation of something called Stein's Law, which is utterly beautiful, if only for its sheer simplicity. It states, if something cannot go on forever, it will stop. It seems trite, but this essentially is the fundamental truth behind every bubble. Once valuations get to a point where they become unsustainable, the bubble bursts, and everything ultimately reverts to the mean, which is to say fair value. Often, as in the case of those tulip bulbs, that value is close to zero. Now, the bubbles we've taken a look at in the previous charts all have one very important thing in common, despite them having covered everything from equities to tulips and from oil to houses. They were all driven by greed, every one of them. Now, whether it was these newfangled Japanese miracle stocks, whether it was tech companies valued on nosebleed PEs, multicolored flowers, McMansions made affordable by criminally lax lending standards, each of these bubbles we've looked at has been brought about by that most ugly of human traits, greed. But greed is only one side of a coin that investors all over the world are more than familiar with. It's just one of the powerful emotions that not only drive investors into and out of stocks, bonds, commodities, even houses, but that also cause powerful and regular bubbles to inflate and burst. Greed may well be a powerful driving force, but it's something that isn't a motivator to everybody. I'm sure we all know our share of steady investors who never get caught up in the pull of greed and just keep plodding along looking for safe, consistent returns instead of going after the 10 baggers. The other side of that coin, however, is something that's present to some degree in every living human being. Okay, maybe not every living human being, but certainly the vast majority of us, and that's fear. Fear-driven bubbles are always more powerful than those driven by greed, because as we've discussed, the driving emotion behind them is present in everybody, except Mr. Norris, of course. And so they always pull in a lot more people. Once these fear-driven bubbles begin to inflate, they can often feel like a battle for survival to people. It becomes almost visceral. Back in the 1970s, we saw the perfect example of a fear-driven bubble when the gold price was catapulted from $35 to $850. That's a 2,400% increase. And that was all due to a combination of fears. Fears over inflation, fears over higher oil prices, fears over unrest, uh, unrest in the Middle East. Is this starting to sound familiar? It certainly is to me. But we'll get back to gold in a moment. Now, the amazing thing about bubbles is that in hindsight, they're all completely obvious, every one of them, to everybody. And yet in the heat of the mania phase, 
there are always plenty of people justifying valuations that, to a few people, seem utterly ridiculous. Now, at the peak of the NASDAQ bubble, the NASDAQ 100 was trading on over 100 times earnings. That's an index, trading on 100 times earnings. And between 1986 and 1999, it had annualized gains of 38% a year. Those numbers seem clearly outrageous, sitting here and looking back. But at the time, there were no shortage of believers that this time really was different. At the peak of the Japanese bubble in 1989, when I was living in Tokyo, the land underneath the Emperor's Palace in Tokyo was said to be worth more than the entire state of California. That's clearly ridiculous, and yet there were no shortage of people more than happy to say that out loud at the time. In the case of every bubble, there are always just a few lone voices who recognize them for what they are at the time. But generally speaking, these voices go unnoticed. People are far too interested in capturing this huge updraft. Right up, and, uh, right up until the day, these few lone voices are proved correct. I don't know how many people in the room here uh, had heard of John Paulson or Kyle Bass prior to the subprime meltdown, but I'm willing to bet it was pretty small. Now, there are two bubbles I want to talk to you about today, one of which I believe is just about ready to burst and one that's just about ready to start inflating. And it's the, If you can spot these bubbles when they're about to start re uh, inflating, that's where you can make some real money. I'm talking about government bonds and gold. Now, these two asset classes have one very important thing in common, which is always, up to now at least, tied them together. But soon, I believe, this is going to tear them apart. And that's the fact that they are both seen as safe havens. Both gold and government bonds are different to most other asset classes, and that when either make a big upward move, it's never down to greed, but rather fear, which may seem counterintuitive in the case of gold, which has always historically been associated with greed. But when it comes to investment, gold is most definitely a fear-driven asset. Now, right now, both of them are moving solely based on fear and uncertainty. One of them has just about reached its peak, and the other uh, is just about to move into the mania phase, I believe. So we'll begin with uh, today's bubble, which is government bonds. Now, this chart shows the explosion in the level of debt issued by the governments of the US, the UK, Japan, the Eurozone, as well as the external debt of China since the turn of the century. In 1999, that debt totaled a little under $16 trillion, way back when a trillion was still a fantasy number. As you can see, until 2001, government debt was actually declining in aggregate. But then came 2001 and Alan Greenspan's ham-fisted attempt at staving off a recession in the USA after 9-11. Greenspan slashed rates from 6.5% down to 1.75%, but more importantly, in a move that many, including myself, firmly believe set the table for the enormous credit bubble that burst so spectacularly in 2008, he kept those rates below 2% for almost two years, the results of which can be clearly seen in the chart behind me. By 2011, that debt had ballooned to $41 trillion. It seems as though the only way out has been palatable to politicians and central bankers uh, alike is to apply the wisdom of history's great thinkers, men like Homer, for example. Sadly, uh, these clowns picked the wrong Homer, and they seem to believe that uh, debt is the solution to a terrible, terrible debt crisis. But let's get back to those government bonds, shall we? This chart shows the yield of the US 10-year bond, the most widely traded fixed income instrument in the world. As you can see, the yield is at lows not seen at any point since the 1980s. In fact, the yield is at lows not seen since, well, ever. Here we have the yield on the US 10-year going back to 1790, through American independence, through the Civil War, and through World War II. And the dotted yellow line there you can see indicates where we stand today, roughly. Uh, the closest we've ever been to the US government being able to borrow money for 10 years at today's rate was in 1945, right after World War II. And I think it's fair to say the world was a fearful place back then too, albeit for different reasons. This is an extraordinary chart. Uh, and any time I find an instrument trading at 200-year extremes, I'm always curious to find out the reasons why. So let's get back to the US 10-year today. With bonds always quoted in terms of their yield, which falls as the price rises, it can be difficult to see them for what they are. So to make things easier, we'll take a look at the price of the 10-year instead. Now, when we look at the price of the 10-year, a more familiar pattern emerges, which makes it easier to spot any kind of bubble. Now, granted, this chart doesn't have the same parabolic phase we associate with bubbles, but, and this is a very important point to understand, the yield on those government securities technically has a floor of 0%. I say technically because, as we've seen in recent times, many government bonds are actually trading on negative yields, such as the power of fear. Essentially, in several cases, investors are so afraid of the possible outcomes, they're actually happy to pay various governments the privilege of loaning them money. Currently, there are six governments who, due to real fear over return of capital, are in this enviable position. The Netherlands, Austria, Finland, Germany, Denmark, and Switzerland 
which can borrow all the way out to five years at negative rates due to the Swiss franc's perceived status as a safe haven. How safe is the franc? Well, it's as safe as any other fiat currency, as this next chart, the balance sheet of the Swiss National Bank, demonstrates. By pegging the Swiss franc to the euro last year and pledging to print an unlimited amount of Swiss francs to defend it, the Swiss government has completely trashed their currency and seen their balance sheet explode. The Swiss monetary base has climbed 92% since September 2011. Now, I don't think the Swiss franc looks much like a safe haven to anybody, uh, at least of all me, and I'm sure anybody else in the room. Amazingly enough, both the price and the supply of government bonds throughout the world are simultaneously at all-time highs. Now, does that make sense to anybody? Is there anybody here who thinks that situation can go on forever? No? Then back we go. If something cannot go on forever, it will stop. The US Treasury Inflation Protected Securities Curve, or TIPS, illustrates perfectly just how far away from the fundamentals things in the sovereign bond market have gotten in the last decade or so. The principle of the TIPS is adjusted for the CPI, as is the coupon. Traditionally, the holders receive CPI plus a nominal premium over inflation. Now, as you can see from the progression of that curve, while its shape has changed, it's been moving steadily lower until we reach the point today where the TIPS curve is negative out to an amazing 20 years. The buyers of those bonds will receive the government-manipulated CPI increase, which I am reliably informed by the Bureau of Labor Statistics is running at 1.4%, give or take, less anything up to 1.5%, depending on where along the curve you buy. At the long end of that curve, buyers are signing up for negative real returns for almost an entire generation. Government bonds are in a bubble. That's a fact, folks. And while inevitable is definitely not the same as imminent, Stein's law will apply at some stage. Government bonds are also a fear-driven bubble. They've been driven to extremes that, given the pervasiveness and the sheer size of the debt burdens of the entities which issue them, future generations are going to look at these government bonds like we look at 17th century tulip prices today. But now we come to the other bubble, the bubble that is just about to start inflating, and that's gold. Now gold has differed from other bubbles in that at every stage along the way throughout the last 11 years, gold has been called a bubble more times by more people and with greater enthusiasm than just about every bubble I've witnessed during my time in financial markets. This isn't a bubble people want to get in on. For some reason, it's one they just don't seem to want to happen. But why is gold not a bubble when so many other assets that have taken similar trajectories over the years most certainly were? The answer lies in those pesky things we call fundamentals. Remember this chart from a few minutes ago that shows the explosion in central bank debt since 1999? We'll take a look at the growth in the supply of gold during the same period. Gold cannot be printed at the whim of profligate governments hell-bent on staving off collapse, so the increase in supply relies on more being physically dug out the ground, a process that gets harder and harder each year as the remaining ore bodies get more difficult and, more importantly, more expensive to access. Fundamental number one, gold cannot be printed. A look at the balance sheets of the world's big six central banks since 2007 shows how they've ballooned in unprecedented fashion as they've both bought the debt issued by their own governments and toxic mortgage bonds in an attempt to shore up a failing system. During that same period, the amount of gold available in the world, measured in tons, has increased by a staggering 8%. Fundamental number two, gold cannot be printed. The great Jim Grant of Grant's interest rate observer fame has coined so many wonderful phrases it's impossible to keep track of them all, but this is perhaps one of his best and certainly one of my own favourites. Over the past several years, the gold price has been steadily reflecting the deterioration of this faith in central banks as they've set upon a course of currency debasement that will be studied for centuries once the inevitable denouement has come and gone. Throughout that time, central banks have been steadily selling their gold in order to finance a small part uh, of this monetary base expansion. But, despite the paranoia that investors have always had over the presence of central bank sellers overhanging the market, the price of gold has continued to rise in the face of this constant selling pressure. Why? Because at the same time they are selling their gold, these same central banks are simultaneously destroying the denominator, which we call money. Lately, however, a new phenomenon has begun to take shape that suggests not only does gold have a lot farther to run, but a new and incredibly powerful demand dynamic has appeared, a dynamic that will, that, that will drive gold into the mania phase and far beyond it. Central banks have begun to lose faith in each other. Now, since 2009, central bank gold holdings have been steadily rising as the realisation dawns that currency debasements in a vacuum are OK. But when everybody's at it, you better have some physical assets or you risk drowning in a sea of fiat paper. 
According to GFMS, in the first half of 2012 alone, central banks bought 273 tonnes of gold. That's a 34% increase over last year. And they're forecast to add an additional 220 tonnes before the end of this year. And my bet is that estimate ends up being low. Fundamental number three, gold cannot be printed, not even by central banks. And a, a closer look at the actions of some of those central banks is actually pretty telling. First up is Korea. The Bank of Korea has increased its gold holdings by 400% in the last 12 months alone. But that's nothing. Mexico has increased its holdings by a staggering 2,083% in roughly the same time period. That's 12 months. The Philippines, Uzbekistan, Thailand, Russia, the Ukraine, Argentina, Saudi Arabia, India, all these countries have added significant amounts to their gold reserves in the last 12 months. Fundamental number four, the largest most price insensitive institutions in the world are all buyers of gold. But there's one obvious name missing from that list which I want to take an even closer look at. And of course, that, uh, that name is China. Now, in 2003, Chinese central bank gold reserves were just 600 tons, as you can see from this chart appearing here. In 2009, China shocked the world when it announced that those reserves had almost doubled to 1,054 tons. But if we look at the total reserves of the People's Bank of China, what's truly shocking was the insignificance of that number as a percentage of their three trillion in total reserves. It was 1.8%. Now, since then, China has stepped up its gold purchase program significantly, uh, though the current uh, level of their holdings is shrouded in mystery, and it's likely to remain so for the foreseeable future, because announcing their current holdings would be completely self-defeating, in that it would send the price into the stratosphere. In the meantime, however, China continues to buy gold. In fact, China is buying as much physical gold as it can lay its hands on every single day. This chart of gold imports into China through Hong Kong shows how dramatically Chinese purchasing of gold has picked up since the second half of 2010. This year alone has seen a steady accumulation of gold bullion through Hong Kong, to say nothing of the 355 tonnes of gold that China, which is now the world's largest producer, mines annually. And not one ounce of that is allowed to leave its borders, certainly not legally at least. Which brings us to fundamental number five. The richest, most price insensitive institution in the world is also the biggest buyer of gold. The steady accumulation of gold this past year has been greeted with a barrage of comparative headlines. Uh, with people comparing China's gold imports to the UK's combined gold holdings, the ECB's holdings, individual countries' gold holdings. And it's in these comparative headlines that the true reason for the coming explosion in the gold price can be found. We are in the midst of an unprecedented global debt crisis. Central banks charged with stimulating their respective economies realise that the only way to do that is to attempt to inflate that debt away. The alternative, default, is far too painful and far too politically unviable. Now, to attempt this in direct competition with so many other central banks is proving harder than their combined decades of mostly academic study ever suggested it would be. And as you can see from this chart, this has led to a staggering 259 stimulatory or easing moves globally across the last 12 months, actually 260, uh, including QE3 uh, when it was announced. This chart was put together a week before QE3. Um, and even, even since then, there have been around four or five more moves uh, around the world to, to, to stimulate and ease policy. Now, just as the central banks are trying to stimulate their own economies, uh, their peers are doing exactly the same thing, and all of them doing it through monetary stimulus of one form or another. Now, as these guys all competitively print money in unison, so many of them are trying simultaneously to buy gold to underpin these ever-weakening currencies. This scramble for gold among central banks is set to accelerate, and their problems are going to intensify, and the stimulus supply will inevitably become more and more reckless. How are they going to pay for their gold? By effectively printing the money to buy it. Is that going to work? Not at these prices. No way. A fear-driven bubble amongst a group of buyers who can literally conjure up the money to buy the asset they're chasing out of thin air could be the largest that mankind has ever seen. Fundamental number six, there is not enough gold in the world at current prices to satisfy central bank demand. Here's a favourite slide of mine that puts some perspective around the coming race amongst central banks to own gold. I used this in a previous presentation I gave earlier in the year. These are the largest 10 holders in the world uh, of gold by tonnage. There's actually 11 bars here, the farthest left being the combined uh, European Union holdings, which total about 10,000 tonnes. But you'll notice an empty slot at the far right. Now, I'm not going to ask if anybody uh, knows 
what this bar represents because a lot of people watching this will have seen my previous presentation they'll know this is Indian households the private gold holdings in India represent 18,000 tons or to put that into clearer perspective that's about the same amount held privately in India as is held by the combined might of the central banks of the European Union and the USA if you think central banks aren't about to get serious in their accumulation of gold I really think you need to think again now we've spoken about how bubbles driven by fear are the most powerful of all and we've seen how government bonds have been driven driven to bubble valuations by investors terrified about systemic problems particularly as the eurozone threatens to splinter but sooner or later there will be a resolution to that particular crisis although it's likely to be very very messy indeed we have a, a, another summit this weekend i believe that end is going to come far sooner than most people believe and when that resolution presents itself three things are going to happen Firstly, it's going to be accompanied by a flurry of money printing as governments attempt to stave off the panic that would go hand in hand with a likely collapse of the entire European banking system. Secondly, it will precipitate an adjustment of collective focus back to the real world and the real economy and real valuations just as the global economy is set to enter a coordinated recession. Thirdly, the world will be forced to reassess the true value of their government debt holdings, <coughs> Excuse me, a reassessment that will not be pretty in any way, shape or form. And fourth, central bank fear over dramatically debasing currencies is going to lead to an arms race to accumulate gold. Central bankers and governments have done everything within their powers to avoid the harsh realities of the global credit bubble. And many things, in fact, that go way beyond those powers. Government bonds have been bid up to all-time highs by terrified investors at exactly the time that the finances of those governments are in their most perilous condition ever. Faced with a solvency crisis, they first treated it as a liquidity crisis. Then they tried treating it as a confidence crisis, and they've now flooded the entire world with an ocean of fiat paper and expanded their balance sheets to the point of insolvency. Make no bones about it, these actions are utterly reckless, and they've set the stage for a disaster. Yet somehow, through all this, the bonds being issued are valued more highly than at any time in their history. Now, though, they've reached the point where finally fixing the problem has become the problem. The moment confidence returns to markets, investors will, like the tulip buyers of the 1630s, realise exactly what it is they're holding, and the panic for the exits will begin in earnest. That's when the real fear will begin. As bonds are dumped, rates will skyrocket, and governments the world over, their balance sheets in absolute tatters, will be forced to print more and more money in order to simply survive. Upon dumping their government bonds, investors will rush headlong into the only true safe haven asset that has no counterparty risk, gold, and that will put them in direct competition with the world's central banks. That's when the mania phase hits us, and that's when we see the real fireworks begin. As Mackay said, collective sanity is slowly beginning to return, and as Mackay said, men go mad in herds, and they recover their senses one by one. You can see in the prices of peripheral European government debt, you can see in the decreasing effectiveness of QE3, and above all, you can see in the steady advance of the gold price uh, over the recent months, you can see that sanity returning to markets one by one once the herd fully recovers its senses you will see what a truly fear-driven bubble in gold really looks like now, until that point comes I will leave you with a little roadmap just uh, of the current gold bull market so you can see where we are we are right here in the sweet spot the mania phase is just about to begin thank you very much indeed